Folks, welcome. On behalf of the Wallingford 350 Jubilee Committee, looking at our members of our Moments Committee, it's exciting to think that in two years plus, we'll be talking live about our 350th anniversary of our town's founding. June 2020 is going to be around the corner. And today, we're going to talk about some of the moments that we've compiled. This Moments Committee has been working for almost two years to identify the top 350 moments in our town's history. Let's introduce some of our members just so that our viewing public knows you in person, not that you need any introduction. Jerry Farrell, president of the Wallingford Preservation Trust. We're looking at Mary Beth Applegate, historian from the Wallingford Preservation Trust, and vice president of the Wallingford Historical Society, Bob Beaumont. And of course, we have a number of constituents also part of the committee, including representatives from the library, and the Board of Education also participating in this project. But Jerry, I, I want you to fill us in. Um, let's remind us about what the goal was and what some of the uses of our moments list is going to be. Well, Jubilee 350 celebrates all 350 years of Wallingford's history, culminating in the year 2020. Um, the committee thought, what a better way to put together all the snippets of Wallingford life by coming up with 350 facts, whether they're when the town got started, when schools got started, when baseball teams were formed. All of these things about community life that you know really are indicative of the fabric of the community that we've come up with a list of over 400, not a mere 350, but over 400 uh, facts about Wallingford's history. We've ordered them chronologically, so you know they go forward from when those 38 families came up from mm -hmm. New Haven in 1670, really right to the present day. Um, and I think it's a great project that, you know, some of us do know a lot about Wallingford history and others know bits and pieces. And here this sort of brings it all together in a nice fashion that no matter who you are, you're going to be able to look at this and get something out of it. You know, I, I mm -hmm. would love to see our public schools make use of it, of um, new young people in Wallingford to be exposed to all of these mm -hmm. points of light about Wallingford history, but even older people of, you know, it causes you to reminisce about some of the pieces of your own life that have been lived in Wallingford that you remember yourself personally, you heard parents or grandparents talking about. Um, so I think it's a great endeavor and it's one that, you know, there will be a lot of uses for these 350 moments um, over the next several years. It's such an exciting Jubilee project and I have to commend all of you, um, really looking at Bob and Mary Beth and, and Jerry, a number of, of items that you, you we used Google Drive, of course, we're a paperless technology group, um, and utilizing that edit function, we were able to all work on that document at the same time um, over the summer months, compiling, reorganizing Mary Beth um, and, and Bob, and, and again, just really adding that up and trying to organize that. Let's start off, with, let's look at a few. We're going to pick five or six today and, and just tease a few over the next year and a half um, to two years. We'll be unveiling that in a number of media channels that, that Jerry just referenced. So let's start off. Jerry, I've heard about Winston Churchill, and he's got some type of reference here in Wallingford. Why don't you introduce us to that? Well, topic? it's really interesting when you say to people that Walling, Wallingford had something to do with Winston Churchill. Well, remember, Churchill was the Prime Minister of Great Britain during World War II, that he, he's known for leading Britain through those really uh, terrible days of the Second World War. Um, but did we know that he has Wallingford roots, that his mother, Jenny Jerome Churchill, um, came from a Wallingford family. Her great-great-grandfather, uh, Aaron Jerome, born in 1764 in Wallingford, um, that was how she was related to the town. A lot of us have watched Downton Abbey, um, which is about American women called dollar princesses, wealthier women who married into the British aristocracy. 
So here's Jenny Jerome. You know, background is a Wallingford person. Bit of a New York City socialite in her younger days. Um, goes to England and marries Lord Randolph Churchill, uh, one of the landed aristocracy, one of the biggest aristocratic families in England. They have a son, Winston, um, who goes on to become the Prime Minister of England. Um, you know, a, a really different link for Wallingford to have. That one we know very directly about. I'd sort of remind you that the name of the family was not just Churchill. It was Spencer Churchill. Well, Spencer, English history. Anybody remember Lady Diana Spencer, later known as Princess Diana? She was part of that family too. And there's a lot of Wallingford roots that Lady Diana Spencer and Winston Churchill have. And to think, well, there's Diana Spencer's children, Prince William, Prince Harry, um, with their American Wallingford roots ascending the British throne. Who would have thought? What I find most interesting about that, though, is that because he has these Wallingford roots that go back into the 1700s and comes Bowen from there, is that his ancestors fought in several of the battles against the British in the Revolutionary War. We don't speak about that very often. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say he doesn't speak about that, that he fought against his own, where he then went on to rule later on, but... Uh, but he was also very proud of his American roots. Absolutely. Let's switch over and talk about mm -hmm. some schools mm -hmm. in Wallingford. The schools have had a major impact. We have, I think, somewhere around 75 that relate directly to the different schools in Wallingford. And we're talking not just the public school system, which started very early on, but we have a private school which opened in 1900. And the thing that's interesting is that education was generally focused on the male member of the family. But this was a school in Wallingford, the uh, Phelps School for Girls. This school opened originally in 1900, and it was on the corner of North Main and Academy Street. And what we find here, here is a picture that we have, and this was taken in 1900. This is the year that the, um, the school first opened. And one of the uh, persons that we can focus on here, the fourth one in this front row, is Margaret Tibbetts. And she's significant for two reasons. I'm sure many of you have heard about the Tabor House, which was moved because of the library to the outskirts of town on the east side. Mm -hmm. And that was the uh, home that she lived in after she was married. Prior to that, she grew up in the house that is now the Victorian Bed and Breakfast, the Tibbetts House back at that time. In addition to having that picture, we also have one of their yearbooks. And that yearbook has some fascinating stories. I would have to assume that they asked each child in the class to write a story. And that story could be all fictional stories, and they are so interesting to look at and to talk about. <laughs> I, yeah, I sat there the other night just reading these stories. There was one on Halloween. They had all different topics. And it's amazing to see what they talked about back then. Well, the school didn't always stay at the corner of North Main and Academy. Over uh, where the town hall is currently located, that used to be the Judd Mansion. And that is a beautiful estate that was located over on the corner of Prince Street and South Main. And when the Judds no longer lived in that house, that was used for the Phelps School. The only part that remains of that now where the town hall is, is in the back parking lot. You can see the carriage house, which originally belonged to the Judd Mansion. They closed in around 1916, at which time the whole building came down, and that's when they erected Lyman Hall's first high school. 
What vestiges of history just I, sitting yes. right here in the everything, center of the thing, right? You know, everything is connected in Wallingford. That you find out the longer you live in Wallingford, you know everything and everyone is connected. It really, <laughs> it's fascinating. Well, <laughs> and I think some of the, the moments being school related make them very relatable to a lot of people. That, you know, if you've grown up in the town and you've gone to local schools, you'll look at some of these moments and say, Oh, there's almost a part of me. I went to that school. Um, and they span a, a wide variety of the town's history. You have the one-room schoolhouses that you see in the very early period. Then you get the Union Academy around 1910 that was formed on Academy Street. That's why it's called Academy Street. But then later on in the late 19th century, you get all of these little academies like the Phelps School for Girls, like Choate School for Boys, like Rosemary Hall mm -hmm. that were formed in part as, you know, an additional educational kind of system. You know, and we say, oh, Choate, oh, Rosemary Hall. It's almost sometimes these days like we don't necessarily you think of them as locally created institutions, they were, that you had local people um, saying, yes, we need uh, an additional educational institution in the town. And then come forward even further, we have all of the, the schools that are of more recent vintage, that in the 1950s and 60s, you get many of the present schools, Parker Farms, Rock Hill, Highland, all of those schools are in the last uh, 40 or 50 years and they're still in service. So there's something for everybody educationally in the moments. You know, and the interesting thing is this was, this Phelps school was not really the first school for young ladies. First school for young ladies actually was Miss Carrington's. Miss Carrington, about the middle of the 19th century, had a school teaching manners to young ladies. Uh, that was located on what is now Sim Sim Simpson Court, approximately where Half Moon is today. The building was later moved to make room for that building in 1911. The building is still, you know, the old building is still in existence up on uh, North Main Street, almost up to North Street. So there have there have been a lot of different schools, a, a lot of private schools. You had the Morgan School or Putnam School, uh, also on North Main Street for for a number of years, um, but. Wallingford was slow to take up education in terms of building a school. As a matter of fact, was fined at one point by the colony because of the fact that it didn't get its act together and start a school when it reached half a hundred families, which was what the rules were according to the Court, court of Election in the late 1600s. But once Wallingford got going, Wallingford has quite a rich history. It, it, it certainly, education. Superintendent Benzo continues that dynamo. What a rich history. And you think about the egalitarian aspect of, of engaging not just the males of, of the families, but the, the females, mm -hmm. and then all of those pieces coming together mm -hmm. into what we know to be a very vibrant learning community um, of Wallingford. It's amazing. Uh, a big shout out. Right now, I know our co-chair of the Jubilee, Bob Devaney, Junior would be chomping at the bit to jump in. We do um, send him our, our sympathies. He has a week to attend, so he could not make today's session, but we hope to see him in an upcoming second mm -hmm. series of, of our moments. What, what rich history here on the mm -hmm. education. Let's tease a little, another category of our moments committee, not just looking at history with Winston Churchill and looking at education, but we've got another category yet to talk about. Bob, why don't you lead us off on that? Well, one of the things I've been involved with for a number of years is history concerning the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. And one aspect of it that I find highly interesting is not just Wallingford's participation and our, our early activity in, you know, in taking up the battle cry, so to speak, uh, for our nation's freedom. But not everybody wanted to go into the war. And one gentleman by the name of Noah Yale had a son who, he didn't want to have to have his son go to war. So, Noah offered one of his black slaves, a young man by the name of Chatham Freeman, his emancipation in exchange for serving instead of his son going to war. Well, Chatham took him up on that. He was drafted 
into the Revolutionary War, served in the six in the six uh, Connecticut, and this was in, in 1777, and continued in that capacity in as a private uh, for the next five years, and was released in 1782, and then, and I will quote for divers good causes not diverse, divers, good causes. On April 29th, 1782, almost, you know, he was given his freedom, along with the freedom of his wife and the freedom of his child. Now, the interesting thing is to me, not only, you know, you know we don't think of slavery, you know, very often as being part of the North. Uh, however, of the 4,915 people who went in and served in the war, in the American Revolution, there were some 12 Negroes in there, and these gentlemen were you know, had names such as Negro Boston or Negro Joe, Negro Peter, Negro Prince, Black Boss was one of them. Of course, Negro Chatham Freedom, Negro Lemon Cumber, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is the way they were listed in the Adjutant General's listing in the late 1880s when he wanted to have a complete, as complete a record as possible of everyone who served in the, in the war. And this was later done with other wars. But this is something that I don't think most people realize, that, you know, that we had as many slaves in this town as we did. You know, and that's what I would call the hidden history of Wallingford at times, of things that, you know, they vanished from the scene, so they sometimes vanished from the mind, but in recreating the moments, we're bringing back some of the things mm -hmm. that people have indeed forgotten. That, you know, I live in the North Elm and Academy Street area, and I was saying to my son, who's 10 years old, you know, some of our, our neighbors, some of the houses around us were from the colonial period. They had slaves. and. You know, he looks at me as, Dad, how is that possible? But, you know, indeed, throughout its history, Wallingford has had a community of African Americans that during the colonial period, you certainly had an enslaved community of African Americans here. But even in the period after the American Revolution, you had a Free, free black, so-called African-American community in Wallingford that was sizable in nature well into the 20th century. Many of them were connected with the Advent Christian Church. There's been a, a, a diaspora, so to say, of that community that it no longer exists. It exists in some pockets here and there in Wallingford. But you know, to think that we have this traditional African-American culture in Wallingford that really is on nobody's radar. You know, we, we read that, um, you know, Wallingford doesn't have a significant numerically African-American population when actually, statistically, you go back, you know, you had a population in, say, 1900 of several hundred African Americans living in town. The moments are bringing back some of the things that people have long forgotten. But in what a rich tapestry to build from. You know, you look at where we are today with the ethnicity and the diversity that our town embraces and the growth of so many of our cultural and you think about all the educational pieces in our town and how rich that has become because of our diversity that's growing. And even the uh, Civil War, one of the significant names here would be William P. Smith, mm -hmm. who's buried in our Center Street Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to go and serve in the uh, Union Army at the time, but they were not allowing blacks to serve until uh, legislation was passed by the government that said they could serve provided that they were in a unit led by a white officer. So he had to go to Massachusetts in order to enlist, and he served, and he was injured, and uh, after the war he came back and he settled in Wallingford, actually down in the area of Community Lake. He had a small area down there where he lived and he raised his family. So very interesting how all of these things, again, intermingle. Fascinating. You mentioned the, the cultural part of it. Let's touch on something in Wallingford, which, is Oakdale Theater. Now, um, 
everyone's familiar with Oakdale, and depending on how long you've lived in Wallingford, determines uh, whether or not you remember Oakdale back when it was the theater in the round. And this mm -hmm. is a picture which shows the original Oakdale Theater, and rather than having the big enclosed building that's there now, it was a tent, it was a huge round tent, mm -hmm. and people would come there, and instead of seeing individual music venues, such as they have now with the different groups coming in and performing, their basic thing was to have Broadway shows. And this is one of the billings of their programs, and it doesn't say what year it is. It talks about May through July, what they're going to be showing there. And these are all very popular Broadway shows. I see Auntie Mame on there, The King and I, um, what else do we have here? Jam Yankees. Jam Yankees, mm -hmm. No Time for Sergeants. And this attracted hundreds and hundreds of people coming there because in this little town, they didn't have to go to New York City now to see a Broadway show. These are being performed right here locally. You could get season tickets. And because it was a theater in the round, it was really a lot harder for the presenters because they had audience sitting all around. So they had to be turning and facing different sides to be seen. So it continued like this for a long time, but it was towards the 1990s that the economy turned around, people weren't spending as much money on it. And the two gentlemen who owned the Oakdale were Benjamin Siegel, correct? Mm, Benjamin yeah, Siegel and Bob yeah. Hall. So the two of these gentlemen uh, ran the Oakdale up to that point. Then they decided to sell it. And uh, after the sale, it went to uh, Live Nation, which is the largest producer of entertainment in the world. Mm -hmm. So they have access to people from all over, the, all over the world as performers that come here. And now they have individual shows. They're not lasting for as long. They're not like, these shows would run at least a full week, mm -hmm. if not longer, depending on the, uh, the interest level on them. But once they uh, were taken over by Live Nation, you had individual performers coming here. They're still operating. Uh, I don't want to start naming any of the shows that are coming up, but <laughs> I was looking at their schedule today, and it would be something, you know, people should look into, but realize at the time the history that's behind this. Mm -hmm. It didn't always look like this, and at one time it had the Oakdale Tavern, which was alongside of that, and the two ran together for quite a while, and unfortunately they did not continue. It'd be so nice to be able to go there for a lovely dinner before going to the show. But the Oakdale Tavern, that goes back, does anybody know the date on that? The building goes back to the 1760s. Seven, 1700s. No, no the so. tavern itself is much newer than that. I mean, mm -hmm. as far the as... The one that's being, here now. Yeah, you know, right. the one that, well, the, probably around the early 1900s approximately, but it was the Peter, Hall, uh, Peter Jones place, I believe. And probably because that house was built that they ended up building up the area in front of it mm -hmm. so that the Hartford Turnpike finally ended up going as we know it today mm -hmm. because it had been too swampy there initially. So they ended up having mm -hmm. the Hartford Turnpike up, but it's now Jones Road and coming back down. Cool. Just ah, okay. we've, we've all enjoyed a show, of course. I mean, what a <laughs> lovely entertainment venue it's been over the decades. Uh, oh, but yes. we just jumped from the 1600s to the 1800s right here to the current day. So Absolutely. think about the diversity of moments that we have mm -hmm. in those 350 plus, I mean, I think we're what, over 400. <laughs> we have a lot to cover, but mm -hmm. thank you for that walk back in time, at least on our cultural mm -hmm. attractions. Sure. We're gonna cover another category, a genre of journalistic. We've got some, um, I think, props here that Mr. Beaumont would like to show us about the Ooh. first newspaper. We know the Record Journal, our beloved newspaper here in town, but let's talk about the first newspaper. Well, one of the very earliest newspapers we had was a, a paper called The Only for a Witness. Started in 1886. Uh, this happens to be a copy of volume one, number 48. It came out on a, on a weekly basis. A little bit different than today's newspapers, but, it, it, but you had advertising right on the first page and which you don't normally see. This was the first, if you will, sort of general Wallingford newspaper. There had been one 20 years earlier, which was the Circular, which was put out by the Oneida community, but that was primarily for the Wallingford community subset of the Oneida community, 
as well as the Oneida community itself. This one didn't last very long, uh, but we, we've had a number of newspapers, you know, a number of, uh, over time, and actually in the, late, in the late 1800s, there were several papers that lasted for a year or two or three years. Uh, paper like the Record Journal or one of its early affiliates uh, has been around, of course, since 1867, if I'm not mistaken. E. Smith and his partner Thomas Warnock bought the weekly and turned it into a daily. So that, that, has, that has had legs, but so many of these were just really very short-lived. But this happens to be a copy that the Historical Society had the good fortune to get a number of years ago. I love it. $200 in gold to be given away. We might have to have the Record Journal um, duplicate that very first copy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I think we might have time for one more. Um, we're going to turn. We have to end. There's nothing certain except death and taxes, I think. And I think Jerry's going to give us a little bit of a lesson on taxes and the first applied in Wallingford. Well, you know, we always say that one of the nice things about Wallingford are the low taxes, um, and I guess they date all the way back to the beginning of the community as well, that um, one of those early moments in Wallingford history was 1673, when the first set of municipal property taxes was applied. Um, so, as, as they say, very certain in life, death and taxes, and going back to 1673, indeed so. So it's not just us no. and the town council and Mayor Dickinson dealing with municipality expenses <laughs> and, and on that. Um, well, thank you. Um, on that note, I mean, we've got a number of moments that we're creating. Our website, you can check out our Facebook page and Twitter mm -hmm. for more information and a little quiz time, I think, before we run out of time, folks. We're going to do a little speed round jeopardy of our historians. <laughs> we have some very important experts here around our table. Bob Devaney, you're on next in, in our second series, so you better be studying away. I'm going to ask our first question. Which of our founders exceeded 100 years old? Said, John Moore Sr. Ah, our first centenary. Yeah. And what, how old was he when he, he passed away? 103 was the oh, arguably can't stump the oldest. Here. He was the old, he was the oldest uh, of the male founders, and he was active until well into his 90s. Oh. Gravestone still to be found in Center Street Cemetery. Yes. Got to see Bob Devaney <laughs> down on Center Street for that. You need a special walking tour on that. <laughs> Anytime, he's, he'll give you that tour. Excellent. A nice job. It's not there, though. They don't no, have it because we were choosing that, Mary Beth. Oh, God. We gave away the answer. <laughs> yes. Okay, here's another one. Now we're going to bring us up to um, 1895 is the answer. What was the question? <laughs> It's another tax question that I believe that's when the total amount of taxable property in town ran five million dollars. Yes! Alex Trebek would get ding ding ding. Excellent. Indeed. The value of the first town property reached five million dollars, not in today's age. Believe it or not, the valuation was eighteen ninety-five. Nice job, Mr. Farrell. I've got one, we've got to do a little baseball here. We've got some baseball historians around the table. What major league team practiced spring training at show in the 1940s? Anyone? Casey Stengel's Boston Braves. You're absolutely correct. They were there and they did spring training. And absolutely, you have to touch on baseball. My dad would be very upset if we didn't have a sports <laughs> aspect to this. Well, you're safe today. We've got yes. one by the bell. Folks, thank you. I think we're just about out of time. Yeah. We've, we've looked at just a few of the many moments. We know that every day we define moments. So history, of course, is going to be coming at us from a number of channels in the next two years. The race is on June 2020 for the Jubilee. Thanks for being here. This was wonderful. And we, we're going to do this again and look at some of the moments in history of our, our wonderful town and celebrating the 350th Jubilee. Thanks for being here today. We're going to get some coffee down at Half Moon, and we're going to continue talking about this. Stay tuned for more. Check us out on Twitter, Facebook, online, and then at the library, and of course, around the table. Thanks, okay. folks, for being here, okay. as always. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jerry, Mary Beth, and Bob. And Bob Devaney, more to come. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Have a great day.